In this lecture, we'll be looking at Chapter 12, Artistry in an Age of Industry, circa 1800 to 1900. And as usual, we're going to begin with the context. So at this time period, this is what's known as the Age of Revolution. We have the Scientific Revolution, which we've already talked about a little bit, um, where man is looking more towards knowledge and information that can be scientifically proven for the answers to the world. Also, um, in Europe, we have the French Revolution of 1789, and then the Napoleonic Wars of 1803 and 1815, where Napoleon be declared himself Emperor of Western Europe. Also, directly before this, at the end of the 1700s, we of course had the American Revolution. The American Revolution was one of the first times where a colony had successfully overthrown the empire and established itself as a new country. This greatly influenced the French Revolution. Um, from your history, France actually supported the United States and the American Revolution. What happens in the French Revolution, it's a little bit different than the American Revolution. Here what we have, it's more of a class distinction and a class revolution. And what you see is you see the middle and the lower classes actually throwing off the aristocracy. In fact, Louis the Sixteenth was... Um, decapitated by the people of France and eventually Marie Antoinette, his wife was. And so we have a period of time where the monarchy was disestablished within the French world. Also very important, this is the time of the Industrial Revolution. Now this began in Britain, it spread to France and then the rest of Europe and eventually to the Americas. Now this is very important because we're, what we're going to see here is the rise of industry and technology and a change in the manufacturing process. What happens is factories start to develop and what happens in a factory is that you can produce mass produced products quickly and cheaper. You have to think up to, mo to this time most people how they lived their lives were some sort of a farmer. When you farm, you work, your day starts when the sun comes up, and you work as late as you can. There's the saying, make hay while the sun shines, that refers to this way of life. Also, when you're farming, for a long time, these were very individualistic. So on the farm, you produced what you needed to survive. Well, what happens with the Industrial Revolution is that these products where people had been reliant on themselves to get them, well, you can now get them very quickly, very easily, and at a much cheaper cost. So, for example, instead of having to spend days creating candles, you could just go buy these candles. And so because of this, we see more and more factories arise. More people then are moving to the cities. We're going to see the rise of the cities at this time because they're going and they're working in these factories. And very important at this time, we see the development of what's called clock time. You have to think about this. Before this time period, right, when you were a farmer, when did you work when the sun came up? Well, when you work in a factory, if, when do you work? Well, your scheduled shift. So if you're supposed to be there from 8 to 9, you need to know when it's 8 o'clock. And it's during this time period that the clock became the main way that humans tracked time. Now, at the beginning of this time period, with the rise of industry, we actually see a rise in the economic status for most everyone. Again, we see this rising middle class, and also because of the rise of the cities based off the Industrial Revolution, we're actually going to see a rise in arts, especially the theater, because, say you're working till 5, well, once you're done working, you no longer have to go home and do all these things you used to have to do. So people wanted some form of entertainment. So we're going to see the rise of the arts, especially in the theater. Now, near the end of the 1800s, we're going to see that these working conditions had largely deteriorated. Um, many factory workers then did get taken advantage of. This is also the time of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, who developed the idea of Marxism. This idea was to help the workers, and what they did is they developed the basic, they said the workers developed the basic tenets of socialism. Socialism means the means of products, are, means of production are owned by society, and the property should also be owned by all individuals. 
This is also the time of Charles Darwin, 1809 and 1882, and his idea of natural selection in the origin of species, which was published in 1859. Sigmund Freud developed psychoanalysis that deals with the unconscious mind. And then art during this time period no longer depended on patronage, meaning classically when we had an artist, they'd have to have some sort of wealthy patron who would support them. Well, art almost became its own independent industry, and artists actually tried to avoid having to work for a patron. And then in Asia, we're going to see Japan beginning to open to international pay, uh, trade. Japan had wanted to be seen as a modern country, but for years, and I mean centuries, it had actually closed its doors. It didn't want to have anything to do with the Western world. And because of this, Japan began to be seen as kind of backwards and behind. And what happens is Japan does not want to be left behind in the modern age. So they begin to open their doors, and how they uh, do this to make themselves look more modern is that they begin to look very, very Western. In fact, if you look at buildings of this time period, um, they have a very strong Western influence, and especially the military. In fact, there are images of the military in Japan that you would think were either British or American, is how they were looking. In Africa, in the 19th century, the exploration and colonization of Africa by Europeans continue, and there was this attempt to Christianize and civilize the savages or the barbarians that were there continues. In the Americas, as I've already stated, at the end of the 1700s, the America, America established itself as a sovereign company or country. Um, in the 1800s, America achieves manifest destiny, which is the idea that it was the Americans' God-given duty to explore um, and claim all the worlds to the all the lands to the west. And then we see the exploitation of Native Americans and slaves continue. In 1823, President Monroe declares the Monroe Doctrine, which basically um, was America closing its borders, saying that this country is an established country and any attempts to colonize it will be seen as an act of aggression and therefore an act of war. And this was a very um, bold statement for such a young country. Also, as I said earlier, industrialization works its way to the United States. And what happenings, happens with this, it actually created um, and helped widen the gap between the North and the South. The North became very urban and industrialized, while the South remained agrarian and dependent on the plantation economy. With the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, southern states begin to secede, and the Civil War breaks out from 1861 to 1865. So that's your context, that's your overview of what's going on in the world. Now for this lecture, these are the artistic styles I want you to know. Romanticism, Realism, Aestheticism, Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, and the Art Nouveau. Now we'll begin with Romanticism. What happens in the idea of Romanticism is it's based somewhat on the ideas of the philosopher Immanuel Kant. And what happens in the late 18th century, he claimed there is a noble world of sense and perceptions and an unknowable world of the essence. He said the real world is a mental reconstruction of the ideal world. Thus, reality is actually found in the mind. This idea is also called romanticism. Now, when we think romanticism, don't just think romantic love. It's not all hearts, puppies, kittens, and unicorns. However, romanticism does focus more on the emotions. And what happens because of this, this was actually a reaction to the rationalism of the previous times. In romanticism, we're going to see a celebration of individualism, the imagination, free expression, feeling, and then communication with nature. We're all valued within this. The artists were not, most often, not trying to represent the world with exact honesty or um, realistically, but what was more important in romantic works is usually the message and the meaning behind the works themselves. And then very important is this role of nature, and we'll talk about this more. It's the role of what's called the sublime. The artist was seen as a visionary genius who possesses the ultimate insight into fundamental reality and could reveal this insight to others through their works. 
Now again, artworks did not have to be perfect, meaning no idealized perfection, but often they were more important about the message and the meaning. So we're going to begin with painting. Painting in the Romantic tri strives for freedom from social and artistic rules. Expressive intent ruled over formal content, and works played with line and color to affect the viewer. Now the work we're going to see here, this is Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, and this is the Grande Odalesca, otherwise known as a harem girl. It's an oil on canvas, 1814. And this work is actually more of a transitional work, moving from the neoclassic to the romantic. Because again, we see those very crisp, clear lines and the color palette of the neoclassical, yet the subject matter is much more romantic. And I would even argue this actually has some manneristic qualities to it. If we look at her spine, look at how long that spine is, and then even look at the proportion between the two legs. So this is kind of more of a transitional painting. Now, one of the probably the most important artists to the Romantic movement is Francisco de Goya. He was a Spanish artist, uh, 1746 to, six, to 1828. And what we see here within his works is his works, he tried to capture again the emotions of a moment. And we can see that in this image here. This is not in your book. However, this is Yard with Lunatics, 1794, and it's an oil on tin plated iron. And what happens with this is de Goya had spent much of his life, he was um, a painter for the Spanish king, but at one point in his life he actually became very ill and he went deaf. And because of this, at this moment, after he became deaf, his works took on a much darker um, point of view. And we're going to see that in works such as this, because you have to remember at the time, if you were hearing impaired, that was considered an illness, and you could actually be put in an insane asylum. And that's what we see here, that in this work, it's a reflection of his own fears of what his life may turn out to be. And so as you study this painting, you can see very dark. We definitely do not have the clean lines of the neoclassical. In fact, many of the edges are blurred. And as you study this, it's very dark, right? And the only place of light is actually outside the yard, either to the heavens or the outside free world. Also, many romantic works took on a political message. Um, and we see that in this work by Francisco de Goya. This is the execution of the citizens of Madrid, the 3rd of May, 1808. This was painted in 1814, and it's an oil on canvas. And what he's doing here, and in this work, he's actually attacking both the Spanish and the French government. What happens here is this is showing an event that actually occurred, but it's not showing it realistically. Okay, so when we look at this, what happened is part of the Napoleonic Wars, um, Napoleon's troops were in Madrid. The citizens of Madrid fought back against them. Well, the next day, in retaliation to the citizens of Madrid fighting back, the leaders of the Napoleonic army said, okay, we're going to take all of the captives that we have, and we're going to take them outside the city walls, and we're going to execute them. And that's what you see here. So this is an actual event that happened, yet he's changed it somewhat to add to that emotion, to the drama of it. Now this painting at the time period was considered very, very gory. If you look, we actually have three moments. We have on the left-hand bottom, we have the dead. In the man, the man in the white shirt, we have the dying. And then you can see the line of citizens waiting in line to be executed. Now, this work, again, it's created this way, it's composed this way to create drama. The light source only seems to be coming from this box lantern here, yet how it's projecting light is not realistic. The man in the center with his arms thrown out is wearing a bright white shirt. He is a focal point, so our eyes go straight to him. And how he's standing, he's supposed to represent a Christ-like figure, that basically he is an innocent man. Yet, part of the critique of the government, he's not an innocent man dying for the sins of humanity. He's dying for the sins of the government. Also, what's unrealistic in this is look at the firing squad. They would not be this close to the citizens. Why does he put them this close? Because it adds that emotion, that drama to the effect. 
So within this, again, making a social and emotional statement and not trying to be strictly representational. All right, another artist of the Romantic period is J.M.W. Turner. Um, it's 19, 1775 to 1851. He was an English artist, well known for watercolors, but he also worked with oils, and he's often known as the painter of light. And what's important within his works is he says that truth is what was felt in the idea of the sublime. Now, this is where we're going to talk about the role of nature. The idea of the sublime is that nature is a powerful force that must be respected and that man should not assume that his dominance of it. And we're going to see this in many of the works of Turner. And this is a reflection of the time because you got to think up until this point, scientific discoveries, man is using nature more and more to support um, his own ideas. Well, in the Romanticism, they say, no, nature is there, right? Nature is to be respected because man thinks we're in control, but then events happen and we're not. Um, for example, all the hurricanes that happened in the past hurricane season, we can see how devastating nature can be. And I often say in my classes, you know, this is your Jurassic Park moment. Man thinks he has control, but nature finds a way. And we see that in this image here. This is rain, steam, and speed, the Great Western Railway. And what we see here is we actually see a train crossing the River Thames. Um, this is in 1844, and it's an oil on canvas. And here what we're looking at, it's almost nature versus the machine. We see the train coming across. If you look closely in the bottom right-hand corner, there's actually a little rabbit on the tracks trying to get out of the way. And then it's going over the water. And if you look in the lower left hand, you can see men fishing. Now, when you look at this, it's very blurry. And that was done very intentional because he wanted the viewer to understand the rate of speed. Because the trains at this time would go about 35 miles per hour. For us, that doesn't seem very quick, but at that time period, it was very, very fast. And he wanted the viewer to experience this. Interestingly enough, there's a story of how he actually experienced this, was he was riding on the train, and he stuck his head out the window so he could get that feeling of the wind going through. And then also, if you look up in the sky, it seems almost dirty. Well, the clouds are obscured from the steam and the smoke from the engine itself. This painting is Fisherman at Sea, 1796, and it's an oil on canvas. These are all of the next couple will all be by Turner. Now within this one, we see the idea of the sublime. However, this is not nature violently taking control, right? This is just nature um, in a calm setting. What we see here is fishermen going out to ply their trade early morning when they go out to fish, yet you see the smallness of them within the vastness of nature. Now this painting, The Burning of the House of Lords and Commons, 1834-1835, this is also an oil on canvas. This is actually also depicting an event that occurred in um, 1834 when the Houses of Parliament, right, the Houses of Lords and Commons, literally the seat of the English government, caught on fire and burned. And you can see here, this is that idea of the sublime, right? Standing in the front of nature and realizing you are not in control, that nature is in control. And we can see here on the left, right, the burning, the fire raging. And what's the only thing man can do? Man can just sit there and watch. If you look all along the, the top of the um, bridge, you see people standing there. All the little dots in the foreground are people standing. And even when you look in the water, there's boats with people in them. And all they can do is just sit there and watch as nature literally destroys the seat of government. Now this will be the last um, painting we look at by Turner. This is called Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying Typhoon Approaching. This is often known as the slave ship. 1840 oil on canvas and this is actually in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston so if you ever get there go look at this. Now what's happening in this? Again he's making a very political statement in here. Again we see those characteristics of the romantic not clear crisp clean lines not trying to be strictly representational but the political comment he's making in here 
Is this what he's showing is a practice that actually occurred? And this is talking about the slave trade. And what would happen is when ships would pick up slaves from Africa, as soon as they were on the ship, they were considered property. And they would bring them over to wherever they're going to sell them. And we all know from our history classes what type of conditions those were. Many slaves would die or be sick. Well, what would happen is before the boats would dock, what they would do is any of the slaves that would die, they would just bury them at sea. So once the ships dock, you are then going to sell the slaves. Well, if you have a sick slave, is that going to sell for much money? No. So the practice was what they would do is the sick slaves, they would actually also throw them overboard so they would drown. Therefore, the ship owners could claim they had died and they could claim the insurance money, which would be more money than they would get than if they tried to sell a sick, sick slave. And that's what he's showing within this work. If you look, we see the ship in the, in the left, but look in the foreground. We see these hands and these feet sticking out of the water. And if you look closely, you can still see the shackles and the chains on them. Now think about this. This is not representational because if you were thrown in water with heavy shackles and sh chains, what would happen? you would sink. Well, why is he showing these hands sticking out of the water with the chain still on them? It's supposed to be so the viewer can see and understand what's going on and understand the horridness of this situation. And then also, if you look in the right foreground, you're going to see kind of a swarm. And what we see is we see the fish and the birds actually eating um, the bodies of the dead and the not yet dead in the water. So again, this is meant to be a political statement. All right, moving on to literature. Um, romantic English literature began in about the 1790s, and most of them used Shakespeare as a role model. Here we're going to see probably the most popular of the romantic um, literature forms is the romantic poetry. William Wordsworth, 1770 to 1850, described poetry as the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. And he found a world of beauty through nature and harmony and the harmony between man and nature. In his lyrical ballads, one of his most famous works is a celebration of nature. Other famous poets at the time, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, William Blake, and then what's considered the high point of English romantic poetry included Lord Byron, John Keats, and Percy Bysshe Shelley. Um, Lord Byron often wrote very energetic verse and used rhyme schemes to express different moods, such as She Walks in Beauty from 1814, which I have on the slide for you. Um, he also would write about a hero, Don Juan, who was a natural man. And all Don wanted was love, and his life was a struggle against the hardship of civilization. It showed the brutality, the hypocrisy, and the conventionality of society standards. Byron himself was actually a man to, who lived in excess, and if you want to hear, um, if you're looking for an interesting poet to write about, I highly recommend looking into him. Um, John Keats' poetry, very vivid imagery, sensuous appeal, um, his expression of philosophy through classical legends, and he would like to confront the conflicting impulses of the inner being with the wider world surrounding him. Probably one of his most famous works is the Ode on a Grecian Urn, an Ode to a Nightingale. And then we have Percy Bysshe Shelley. And here, this is the Shelley uh, Memorial. Percy Bysshe Shelley was actually married to Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Um, she actually wrote, she was author, also an author, and she wrote Frankenstein. Her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was well known. She wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792, where she argued that women were not inferior to men, but were kept so because they were not educated. Mary Wollstonecraft actually died giving birth to Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. But again, Mary Shelley educated and wrote Frankenstein, the original title, The Modern Prometheus. Well, she marries Percy Bysshe Shelley. Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote in a more meditative and lyrical vein, and his poetry and pose output remained pretty steady through his life, but most publishers and journals refused to publish his works for fear of being arrested themselves for blasphemy and sedition, meaning causing others to riot. 
His poems reflect his passionate search for personal love and social justice. Now this is the Shelley Memorial at the University College of Oxford. Interesting enough that it's there because he was actually expelled from Oxford, Oxford for writing The Necessary of Atheism. And what we see here is Shelley actually drowned in a boating accident with it when he was 30. But there is some speculation over this of whether it was actually an accident because he and two other men, the other two men who were um, seafaring individuals, um, all drowned and it looked like their boat maybe had been rammed. Now there's the story that when their bodies, when these victims washed up on shore, they would have the funeral prior right there. Why? Because they didn't want to bring these bodies back into the public in case there was disease. Now women at the time were still not allowed to attend funerals because it was seen as they were too delicate so it, was, it would offend their sensibilities. Well, the story is that as Shelley's body um, is burning on the funeral prior, um, that Mary Shelley shows up and she reaches into the flames and takes his heart out. And so there was the, the legend that she had the ashes of his heart. Well, interestingly enough, years and years later, they actually found... Um, after her daughter-in-law had passed away, Mary Shelley had already passed away, after her daughter-in-law passed away, there's the rumor that they were going through her possessions, and they found an envelope, and it said Shelley, and there were ashes in it. So people think that was uh, Piercy Bicey Shelley's heart. All right, your text also talks about Jane Austen, 1775 to 1817, as a romantic writer, but actually she was probably more of a realist than a romantic. Her works often celebrate and find joy in the day-to-day -day life, in the ordinary. Her works explore the human experience, and in most works uses some humor to do this. Examples of this are Emma from 1815. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, Emma has been, many of her works are still remade into modern classics. So Emma was remade, um, a modern me remake of it was Clueless. All right, and then moving on to the romantic music. Again, this was an opportunity to express emotion. However, romantic music actually was not a great leap from classical music. It was more of a gradual uh, progression. We do find an emphasis on the beautiful, the lyrical, and expressive melodies. Emotional conflict was suggested by juxtaposition of different meters and rhythmic irregularities. Often we would find very colorful harmonies that were used. Again, this was meant to excite the emotions. Now, established rules or laws of composition were often disregarded to achieve these striking emotional effects. Dissonance, which is a lack of harmony, was often used again for this emotional response. And then also what became important was the leader or the lead or the art song. Now this was written for a solo voice with piano accompaniment along with a poetic text. And that's what I have for you here. This actually is a poem called Der Elfling or The Elf King 18. Um, the poem was written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe in 1782. However, what happens with this is that we have Franz Schubert um, took this poem and he transforms it into a musical number. And so you can hear the poem being sung, but the music itself actually accompanies it. Um, and what happens in this is the story tells of an anxious young boy who's being carried home at night by his father on horseback. And what happens is the boy, this elf king, is chasing them trying to get the boy. And the boy is very frightened. And within the poem, we hear three different voices. We have the boy crying to his father for help. We have the father trying to comfort the boy. And then we have Der Elkling, or the Elf King, talking to the boy. So please listen to this YouTube clip. It's not very long. And just, it's, I gave you the German version of it, but I just want you to listen to it so you can feel and understand that emotion. All right. Um... Skim pages 327 to 332 in the Romantic Music, but here's just a couple highlights. Piano works became very important due to advances in piano design. Uh, Frédéric Chopin was Polish, but he lived in France, and he wrote almost exclusively for the piano. And what I have for you here, the clip, is this what's called an etude. And this is a piece to help a performer master a specific talent. And so each etude actually explores a single problem.
What you have here is um, revolutionary. It's the etude in C minor um, op 10. And what this is, the idea behind it is most um, people were right-handed. And so when you play the piano, the right hand was much stronger. Well, the point of this one is actually to help develop speed and strength in the left hand. So watch this video, and you can watch as she's playing, almost exclusively she plays with the left hand. Program music also became very popular again during this time period. And remember, program music was music that developed around a non-musical idea. Usually, it's usually telling some sort of story. And probably one of the most famous of this is Berloitz's Symphony Fantastique from 1830. Now, this was written about a hero who actually poisoned himself because of an unrequited love. But the poison actually doesn't kill him, but it causes him to have all these visions, including a ball, a pastoral scene, a dream where he actually kills his beloved, and he is then sent to the scaffolding and hung. And then final is a witch's Sabbath. And here I've also included a section. And I want you to listen to this and think about um, what section this actually is. I'm not going to spoil it for you. It's the witch's Sabbath. All right, um, symphonies, many romantic symphonies followed classical forms, such as Brahms, Symphony No. 3 in F major from 1883. And then a newer trend is we're actually going to see the rise of folk songs. Examples of this is going to be the Russian composer, composer Tchaikovsky, 1840 to 1893. And here I've included in his very famous 1812 overture, and he also wrote the Nutcracker Ballet. All right, opera began again um, to be very, very popular at this time. These grand operas developed. These were staged, spectacular productions, crowded scenery, ballet, um, extreme music, excessive um, costuming. And again, they were supposed to elicit the, this romance within them. Now, theater at the time, interesting enough, the romantic ideas of freedom of form did not translate very well into the theater because many of the 19th century playwrights wrote completely unstageable scripts. In this refusal to conform to the limits of the stage, they, their productions, therefore, were not able to actually be put on. All right, and then very important to this movement is the ballet. When we talk about the classical ballet, we are talking about the romantic ballet. Now, the idea in ballet is that beauty was truth and that dance compromised visual simulation to show beautiful forms and graceful attitudes. Dancing was seen like a living portrait or a sculpture that combines the physical pleasure and feminine beauty. Now, the central role of the Romantic Ballet belonged to the ballerina. The ballerina, light, graceful, dressed in flowing tool. And when you look at ballet, it's supposed to look easy, effortless, raised up from the floor. When in fact, ballet is very, very specific and it's very, very technically difficult to do. Um, most ballet is performed on point, meaning on the toes, and most um, you have to have years of training before you ever actually begin to dance on point. Very specific down to even the placement of the hands and the fingers. And this is why actually a lot of modern day athletes, especially boxers and um, football players, wide receivers, take ballet because it teaches you how to control every single part of your body. Now the objectives of the Romantic Ballet were to show the delicate ballerinas, lightly poised, costumed in soft tulle, moving on point with grace and elegance. And you're going to see this in the example I give for you here, which is La Silphide, 1832, and it was the most famous of the Romantic Ballets. Now here what you're watching is watch for the ballerina's lightness, delicacy, and modest grace establish the standard for romantic ballets of the time. Again, romantic ballets, you, they would tell a story, but almost always without any spoken word. So everything had to be told through the dance and through the music itself. This is also the time when Swan Lake was first produced in 1877 and The Nutcracker in 1892.
Now the two clips I have for you here, again the one is from La Sylphide, um, and then the other one is from the Black Swan from Swan Lake. And what this is, the second one's very short, and that's just showing the foyate, which is the whipping turn that is popular to this day. And again, you can see the technical difficulty within this. And then finally in architecture, we're, or I'm sorry, finally in romanticism, we're going to look at architecture. Now this, we don't really have a specific um, attributes we can talk about because this again was a time of discovery and trial. We are having new technological advancements that are being used and because of this it led to exploration. Some of these new materials included iron, steel, glass, being able to be manipulated in a way that they were useful for architecture. And this is best seen in London's Crystal Palace of 1851, which I'm showing you um, a drawing of it. This was moved later, and then it was actually destroyed by fire in 1936. All right, now we're going to move on to realism. Realism developed in the mid-19th century, and it was in a way a reaction to Romanticism, but more so it was almost a reaction to the invention of the camera, and the idea when the camera was first developed, pun intended, was that it, the camera offered an exact representation of the world. Well, what happens in painting is we're going to see that painting sought to make an objective and unprejudiced record. And we're going to see this, sorry, I'll go back to this one, in works such as this one. This is Gustave Colbert's The Stonebreakers of 1849. And what he is painting, what we see in realism, is in a way this depiction of trying to show the world as it is. This is how he found these men, and he painted them exactly as he found them. This is also what's called social realism, meaning part of the idea of this was to draw attention to the everyday conditions of the working classes and the poor. This was often a critique on the conditions that kept these individuals in their economic positions in societies. And what we see here is these men, their job is literally to break apart stones. I mean, this is literally back-breaking work. Yet what he's doing by showing them as their su his subject matter is he's giving them, he's almost elevating them, showing the grace and the usefulness in works such as this. Now this work, Edouard Monet, Manet, not Monet, don't confuse them, what he strove was to paint only what the eye can see. Yet he believed that painting allowed this to be seen in a way that was different from photography and that the painting reflect his own impressions. And we're going to see later that this um, was highly influential to the style of Impressionism. Now Manet found romantic themes to be superficial, and often in his work to use harmonious colors and subjects from everyday life. He liked to use actual light and weather and not idealize what was going on. And he strove to speak with a new voice. And what we're seeing here, this painting is commonly known as The Picnic from 1863. Now this shocked the public when it was first displayed. It was seen as an immoral, naked frolic in a public Parisian park. And here, what's interestingly enough, as he was playing around with different things, he was actually recreating two very famous different scenes. We can see, look at the man's outstretched hand. This is actually a rec recreation of Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam from the Sistine Chapel ceiling and Raphael's The Judgment of Paris. It obviously takes imagery from these two works. However, this was totally lost on the public at large because all they could focus on was the naked woman um, with the two closed men in a public area obviously making eye contact with us. All right, theater and literature in the realism. Theater, um, one of the most famous playwrights is Anton Chekhov, uh, Russian, 1860 to 1904, and he's considered the founder of modern realism. His plays were about daily life and had accurate representations of frustrations and the depressing nature of existence. And you can see this in 1897's Uncle Vanya, which explores the aimlessness and hopelessness of human existence. We also see this in the works of George Bernard Shaw. He was an Irish playwright, 1856 to 1950. His works, though, were more humanitarian. He tended to have faith in people and their potential. His plays often deal with the unexpected. 
Now he was opposed to this idea of art for art's sake that we're going to talk about in a second. And Shaw insisted that art should have a purpose. And many of his plays carried a social message and he believed that they were more effective than the political writings of the time. Also in the theater and literature at the time, we're going to stress naturalism, which is close to realism, but it states that hereditary environment and environment determine a person's behavior. Now the literature at the time is also the same idea. It, the literature stressed that art and the literature should depict life with absolute honesty, show things as they really are. Often in these works, you're going to see very specific details and historical accuracy and personal objective interpretations, and this was very polar to Romanticism. What happens in many of the works try to convey their moral value system and judgment on others. And you're going to see that in works such as the one I have here. This is Crime and Punishment by Fedor Dostoevsky, um, 1821 to 1881, Russian writer. And what he wrote about is that he, he claimed that humans require penance and that salvation comes through suffering. And he believed that materialism led to decadence and decline. And you see this discussed in Crime and Punishment from 1866. This is a psychological novel. We're going to talk, see many different personalities in it. And basically, it's looking at when we first meet different characters, we think we know who the good person is and who the bad person is. Well, we see what happens when good people basically are forced to do very bad things. In fact, our protagonist actually commits a murder. Um, throughout the text, there is a woman who is a prostitute, and we think of her as the immoral character, yet we also find out why she has to do what she does. And you see that all explored within the works of Crime and Punishment. All right, now the next movement we're going to look at is very, very quickly, and this is what's called aestheticism. This is in the 19th century, and this is also, you're going to hear me, and I've said this before, the term art for art's sake. Well, what happens with the aesthetics is that they believed art needs no other reason than to be beautiful, that it does not have to serve any other purpose. I mean, we've spent, you know, hours talking and reading about all the different things that art can do. You know, romanticism, political message, stirring the emotions. Aestheticism says no. Basically, quit putting all this stuff on art. All art has to do is be aesthetically pleasing, meaning it just needs to be beautiful. It does not need to serve any other purpose. And we see this, um, one of the first lectures we watched or listened to when we talked about what is art, there was a quote from Oscar Wilde that says, all art is quite useless. And that's from the preference of Dorian Gray. And that's exactly what he was saying, that it's quite useless, meaning it doesn't have to have a purpose, that art should not be the vehicle for social and political messages.